On May 17, 2001, Alyssa Turney went missing. According to her stepfather, Michael Turney, he dropped her off in the morning as usual, then picked her up around lunchtime for an unspecified reason. This was unusual, as Michael was usually incredibly hard on Alyssa and didn't let her get away with anything. According to Michael, after he picked her up from school, they had an argument and she stormed off. Later that day, he and Sarah found a note in her bedroom, allegedly written by her, claiming that she was done with the family, she was tired of living under the same roof as Michael, and that she was running away to California. Alyssa had made claims like this before, and she was known to dislike her stepfather. She felt as if he was too harsh on her, and thought it was strange how he would constantly invade her privacy. He'd placed security cameras within the house, always focusing on Alyssa. He'd recorded her phone calls, and he seemed to have a fascination with his stepdaughter that crossed a line. A week after Alyssa vanished, Michael said he got a call from someone who claimed they were Alyssa. The person cussed him out before hanging up, and the police records were able to find that the call was made from a payphone in Riverside, California. At the time, given her troubled home life, the phone call and the note stating that she had run away police didn't investigate her disappearance. Alyssa, it seemed, had gone on to make a new life for herself, and simply didn't want to be a part of the family any longer. However, there were some incredibly big red flags within the case that most had chosen to look over. That is, until Alyssa's younger half-sister decided to get involved. At the time of her half-sister's disappearance, Sarah had been 12, and her life was entirely different from Alyssa's, where Michael Turney would treat his eldest daughter with contempt, talking down to her about her intelligence and recording her calls, he was completely lax with Sarah, letting her party and do whatever she liked. As she got older, she began to realize how strange her father's actions towards her sister had been, and began to think that it was possible that she hadn't run away after all. For years, she collected evidence and spoke out about the case. She made a TikTok page where she posted about her sister and what had happened, and it quickly grew to over 1 million followers. She was intent on getting to the bottom of what happened to her sister, and because of her unending dedication to her cause, she was able to get the case examined and finally get justice. While today's case is not about Alyssa, I bring up Sarah as an example of how social media can be used as a tool for good. How you can bring about change using social media platforms, simply by speaking the truth. Since Sarah's success on social media, and her constantly platforming other stories to help bring attention to unsolved cases, many others have followed in her footsteps. And that is true of today's case. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of James Rail to see if justice was done in this widely contested case. The vast majority of my videos are requested topics sent in from my subscribers, and today is no exception. This video was suggested via email, and was purported to come from someone close to the case. They felt as if justice had not been done and requested that I look into it myself. They sent me links, videos, and articles, and requested that I, as an unbiased third party, look into what went on, and see if there were any signs of conspiracy or corruption. I want to make it clear that that was the starting place of my involvement with the case, as that can be seen as a bias in this investigation. Please be mindful of that as we go forward. I then began to research the case myself, choosing to find my own sources about the subject, watching all available video surrounding the case, and what I hope to bring you today is the most unbiased, neutral look at the case. That way, you may come to your own conclusion. Like before, I will include all the articles, videos, and sources I have referenced in the description box down below, so that you can do your own due diligence and check them yourselves. I want to make my intentions clear, as feelings on both sides of this issue are incredibly hostile and aggressive, and given the reason I was reached out to, I want to make sure you have all the information you need to come to your own conclusion. That said, I ask you to please leave comments you have regarding this case in the comment section down below, rather than seek out anyone that is personally involved. Sending hate to any of the people involved in the situation is unproductive, and you have all the freedom in the world to leave whatever opinions you have down below. With all of that said, let us begin. Who James Rail was varied from person to person, and there are some who characterize him as a loving, fitness enthusiast, who adored his family, and was kind to everyone. He was a caring brother, son, uncle, and friend, who would spend nights taking care of those around him 
who he believed needed it. He would be the first person to offer you a shoulder to cry on and tell you that he believed in you and would explain why he cared. And to others, he was a more flawed being. He would be selfish and uncaring at times, dressing down the people closest to him when he felt slighted. He would push people away and neg them, treating others around him as if they were disposable. James wasn't perfect, and no one is. But on July 31st, James would make a decision that would bring an end to his life. The day before, James began to reach out to his ex-girlfriend, Allison Ducro. Allison and James had dated and broken up two years prior, and the relationship had been rocky. Though they had gotten along as friends for a while before getting together, they had a fair amount of issues as a couple. They would find themselves breaking up, then getting back together, then breaking up again. Allison would recall that when James and her would get into arguments, he had a tendency to go for the jugular and say wildly vitriolic things, like she was unlovable and no one would ever want to be with her. The relationship hadn't been abusive, and he never laid a hand on her, according to her own statements. But there were moments where he would be cruel towards her. After a while, the pair called it quits for good, and they both went on with their lives. Allison stayed in Ohio while James moved out to California, but within the past year, he had moved back. And according to Allison, his friends noticed a change with his personality. While she never reached out to him and chose not to keep in contact, they still maintained a few mutual friends. And they told her that after his time on the West Coast, James had turned into a different person. They didn't go into detail, but he was no longer someone that they said they wanted to spend time around, which Allison accepted. She never reached out to James and had no inclination to do so. For her, the relationship had already ended with their breakup and her life had gone in an entirely new direction. But on July 30th, he called her and left her this voicemail. Hi, Ellie. Um, it's James. Um, I just uh, wanted to reach out to you um, because I, uh, I just wanted to uh, see how you're doing. Um, and uh, maybe hear from you if that would uh, be all right, I guess. Um, it's, it's been a while since I've talked to you, and it's James. I just wanted to uh, see how you're doing and uh, maybe hear from you. It's been a while since I've talked to you. Please give me a call back. Thank you. Allison stated the voicemail was weird and that it scared her. She hadn't spoken to him in years and didn't know why he felt the need to reach out to her, much less why he felt the need to call her multiple times. Allison felt like their relationship was long since over, and there was no need to rehash things, so she ignored the calls and the message, and the next day, she went out to breakfast with her mother. However, while Allison and her mother were driving home from breakfast, James's car pulled up behind theirs and began to follow them. The following clip is from the Duke Rose ring doorbell footage of what occurred after Allison and her mother arrived at home. I do want to give you a moment to skip past this footage if you need to, because it is graphic in nature. If you are not in a place mentally to see or listen to it, that is completely understandable. Timestamps will be placed in the description box if you want to skip this part of the video. Again, I will give you a couple seconds to skip forward. Your mental well-being is important, and if you feel as if this video might be too much for you, please pause and skip, or click on one of the videos in your recommended, and have a good day. Stop it, Allie. Boy, in the house. Allie and her mom arrive home after breakfast and begin to walk to their door when they see James, who had been following them, and pull into their driveway behind them. At the time, neither Allie nor her mom knew that it was James in the car behind them, as it had been over a year since they had last seen him. Allie stops to look, concerned about what is happening, and her mom continues to the door, unlocking it. Allie walks up to the door behind her mom and seems to say, I don't know why he's here, and they go inside, locking the door behind them. Both seem confused and mildly concerned about what is going on, but as neither of them have interacted or spoken with James, it's clear that they do not want to engage with him. 20 seconds after the women enter the home, 
James is already out of the car and at the front door. The doorbell footage is a bit choppy, given it's motion activated and James is standing quite still, but he has now been on the porch for three minutes. He is aware that they are home, and he is aware they have just entered, and logically, he would know that if they haven't come out to the door by now, they aren't going to, and he still hasn't said a word. In my professional opinion, the following portion of this video has been edited, and I have placed a disclaimer on top of the footage to indicate as much. Some of these clips were not released with the rest of the footage via third-party sources, like Law and Crime. However, they were released by James's sister on her Facebook page. I state that the footage has been altered because, unlike every other portion of the video, it has absolutely no audio, and on my editing software I can see where it's been cut out. In every other piece of footage, there is natural sound, but that is not the case here. Despite seeing several cars pass by, there is nothing to be heard. I will get into why this video may have been edited later on. At this point, he has silently been standing there on the Duke Rose porch for four minutes without speaking. His head is hung and his hands are behind his back. He seems generally unresponsive and out of sorts. James leaves the porch and appears to go back to his car or to the side of the home. It's now 11.03. He has been at the house for six minutes. The following is the footage as released by third-party sources. Wait. He's leaving. Hey. He's coming back. Nope. 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 I'm calling him. James, she doesn't want to talk to you. And here's the version released by James's sister via the Justice for James Rail YouTube channel. It's clear that the audio in the version released via the Justice for James Rail channel has been edited and removed so that the voices of the Ducro family expressing concern and telling James to leave wouldn't be included. I do not make this claim lightly. As seen in the clip from the unaltered version of the footage, Allie is talking to her parents, saying that it seems like James has left or is leaving but then sees that he's come back. She seems genuinely confused and concerned. Someone also states that they should call 911, and Ali immediately does so. Nope, 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 I'm calling. James, she doesn't want to talk to you. 
James has now been aware, seemingly for the first time directly, that Allie will not be coming to the door and does not want to talk to him. The footage freezes slightly, so we can't see if he had an immediate reaction, but he chooses not to leave. James continues to stand on the porch and is swaying back and forth. He has still not spoken and has been at the house now for nine minutes. James opens the Ducros storm door, despite being told they do not want him there. He has no reason to enter the home. He has no reason to believe that there is something going on in the home that he needs to deal with and has been told to leave. James jiggles the door handle to see if it's locked, and you hear someone yell from inside the house. They have made it clear a number of times now they do not want James on the property. Again, he has no reason to be there. They've asked him to leave, and he is now trying to enter their home against their wishes. At this point, James is now breaking into the home. He is ramming the door with his shoulder to attempt to break it down. We do not know why he's doing this. He has been silent this entire encounter, and the Ducros are now under the impression that he is there to harm their daughter. Why James is doing this, we cannot say, but it wouldn't be a far leap in logic to state that his intentions when breaking down the door of his ex-girlfriend, one that he has just been explicitly told doesn't want to see him, is not good. James continues to try and break down the door and is making headway. The door lock on the door was beginning to break off, and seeing the door was likely going to break off its hinges soon, Mitch Ducro tries to keep it closed by pushing back against it and yelled to James that he has his gun. Mitch was wearing socks on a slippery floor, and so bracing it didn't help the door stand firm. The following clip contains James's last moments. I will give you a moment to skip and fast forward through the footage if you need. What occurred happened incredibly quickly, so let me break it down. After being warned by Mitch that he had a gun and would shoot, James rams the door of the house once more, this time fully breaking the lock off the paneling, and gaining entry. Mitch was on the other side of the door and quickly shot James three times. The first two shots hit James in the shoulders, as he was ramming the door with his shoulders. The third bullet hit James in the back, as he had turned completely by that time, and was starting to run away. After shooting James, the family stays inside the home. Allie is on the phone with the police, as she had been for the past couple of moments, and states that her dad just saved her life. Their next-door neighbor comes out of his home after hearing gunshots, and sees James on the ground. He goes over and sees that he's been shot and seems unresponsive. The neighbor then calls into the family home, asking what happened. Hey, what? Okay, wait. He's fine. He don't have nothing. He don't have no gun. He don't have no gun. Don't do anything. Okay, well, he's not moving. He don't have a gun. He broke our door in, trying to get into our 
trying to get to our daughter. Our daughter is busted in. Okay, hold on. Did you shoot him? Yes. Okay. Call me. Call me. It's hard to know. We've already, we're on the phone with him right now. Okay, he's not moving. He's, he, he, he ain't going nowhere. I don't know I heard five shots. Like, what the? No, three shots. He, he broke into our door coming in after our daughter. But my husband shot. He took Marilyn in right behind me and my daughter in the car. Oh, jeez. Yeah, so we got in here and he wouldn't leave. We kept telling him to leave, to leave. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're, oh, my God. He's so sorry. I'm so sorry. Obviously, this is a, this was a, that screen is, was he dating her? They was, dated a long time ago. Not, it was a long time ago. I think, and yeah. And he left your voicemail and left his message last night. Oh, my God. Okay, just keep the mail. Calm down. Through the security video and the 911 call, a consistent story emerges. James came to the Duke Row home unannounced. He spent 10 minutes silently standing on the porch and refused to leave when asked. He then tried to break into the home and, after he was warned that he would be shot, broke the door down. What we don't know is why. Following the shooting, the Ducro family was brought to the police station. The following are Allison and Mitch's interrogations. We will start with Allison's. A lot has been made of this clip of Allison smiling when the interrogator enters the room. Most notably, multiple articles were published that negatively characterizes this moment as Allison laughing and smiling during her interrogation. Certain portions of the internet, as well as the initial email I received, characterized this action as her being sociopathic and uncaring towards the death of her ex-boyfriend. In multiple articles and posts on Facebook, Allison has been labeled a heartless monster for her ability to smile towards the officer at this moment. However, this is not an abnormal reaction. It's clear from her body language and general demeanor that Allison isn't happy. She isn't celebrating James' death or having a good time laughing about it with the officer. Rather, she is smiling because a person of authority has entered the room, and she, like most people, has been conditioned to smile when making eye contact with a person. The smile doesn't go to her eyes, and instead comes across as a nervous, uncomfortable smile that would subconsciously quell their own nerves. It's also not abnormal for people who have just gone through extremely traumatic moments to try and snap back into normalcy and attempt to interact with others in a neutral way, which is likely what we are seeing here. It's also entirely normal for people to smile when they are nervous or uncomfortable to ease their discomfort. Hello. All right, Allison, my name's Angie. I'm an investigator here, and I just want to talk to you about what happened today, okay? You need to take a break during any of this, just let me know. You need to use the restroom or anything? Okay. Would you like to have that water? You, you most certainly are welcome to it. Mm -hmm. right. Anytime we interview anybody, we just kind of go over your Miranda rights. It doesn't mean that we think you're in trouble. It's just so that you know that you're, you have rights and what they are. Long. Okay. And after each one, I'll ask you if you understand it. But I don't think you're stupid. I do that with everybody, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. First one is you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that one? Mm -hmm. Anything you say can be used against you in the court of law. Do you understand that one? Okay. You have the right to talk to an attorney and have him or her present with you while you're being questioned. Do you understand that one? Yes. If you cannot afford or hire an attorney, one will be appointed to be present with you before questioning if you wish. Do you understand that one? I just need you to say yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and you can decide at any time when I'm talking to you to exercise these rights and not answer any more of my questions or make any more statements. Do you understand that one? Yes. Okay. And is it A-L-L-I-S-O-N? No, Y-S-O-N. What's your date of birth, Allison? Uh, 114, 2000. 
can spell your last name for me. D U P K R O. And do you live at that 27? Let's just kind of start off from the beginning. What happened today? You don't like my whole day? Or just yep, go ahead. We'll okay. start your whole day. Uh, me and my mom met my mom's friend down for breakfast. Okay. And we were there from, like, I want to say, like, 9 to um, like 10.45, probably. Okay. Where'd you have breakfast? Perkins. Here in Sydney? Yeah. And then we dropped her off. Probably. Where does she live? Oh goodness, she lives over by the fairgrounds. Okay. I'm not, I don't know her like actual okay. address. That's okay, just by the fairgrounds. Yeah, by the fairgrounds. Okay. And then after we dropped her off, we went to the Speedway that's over by that little mini pizza hut. I don't know that address either. Every time Allison has smiled or laughed, it's been out of nervousness. Rather than one showcasing, she is deriding any pleasure from this experience, as she has been accused of. She has laughed twice now, when she has failed to remember an address. And it's clear, given her stilted body language, she's upset and nervous. That's okay. You're probably talking to the person with the worst addresses yeah, in, in the yeah, county. So. That's how my mom is. By the Dollar General? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I think we pulled into the driveway after that. I went like 10, 59 or 11, like on the nose. I was like, wow, we were there for two hours. So when you left Speedway, you went up over the bridge, yeah, by Lehman, yeah, and then then we just turned back to the Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then... And you got home, I'm sorry, what time? Like 10.59 or 11, in fact, it was one of those two. I won't hold you to yeah, one minute. I, I, I remember <laughs> stupid stuff when I get same, nervous. Same, same, that's okay. Um, and like I said, if you need a break, just just let me know. Let's, let's take a breather, okay? Uh, and then we got out of the car, and then like... We were at like the first first little step to get out of the porch and this car like whips into the driveway like two seconds later. Okay. Did you recognize the car at first? No, not at first. We were both like, well, who's that? And we were like, I don't know. It's like, well, hurry up and get inside. Because that voicemail from last night had already scared me. Okay. Let's let's talk about the voicemail real quick. Okay. Who was the voicemail from? James. And did you call him James? Does he go by James? Yeah, that's his legal name, yeah. Okay. Is that what he goes by? Yeah, I'm pretty positive. <laughs> okay. What time did he send you a voicemail? Um, 11.30 or 11.40 last night. Last night? Yeah. Okay. Because he had called me prior and I didn't answer because I'm like, I'm not getting into that. I was like... So you recognize the number when yeah. he called? Yeah. Does it come up James on your phone yeah. or his number? Okay. Do you know his phone number? No. That's okay. Not it's, it'll be in my phone. That's fine. How many times did he call before he left the voicemail? I think it was just once because I was asleep. Okay. So I don't know if it had run prior and I just woke up on the last one before the voicemail or if it was just the one time I was like up. Okay. I don't know. So he called, you ignored it, and he left the yeah. voicemail. Yeah. What did the voicemail say? Well, he was making like a weird noise at the beginning. I don't know what it was. And then he kept saying, hey, um, 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 I want to call you. You should call me back tomorrow because I know it's late. And then he just kept saying, um, after that, I was like. That's a little weird. Okay. Because I know how he usually talks, and it wasn't like that at all. Usually he's very good. He was a nice kid before this. Okay. I don't know what okay. it was. And then how do you know James? I, uh, school. School. What school did you go to? Uh, Fairmont. Okay. You guys were in the same class? Yeah. What year did you graduate? I graduated in 2017. I was a year early, but he would have been 2018. Okay. And did you date him, or how long did you guys date? Okay, so it was like on, it was like an on and off thing for a couple of years. Okay. Um, honestly, in total, maybe like a year and a half, if we added it all up. Like all through your high school years, or after you graduated? It started in high school, and then it went out of high school. Okay. Just very briefly. Okay. On and off, were they bad breakups or just no, kind of? We stayed friends okay. every single time, so I don't. And when was the final breakup, approximately? I would say maybe 2019 or 2020. I'm not positive. Okay. Well, what caused that breakup? He was just being a dick. Okay. 
Sorry, I just, no. I'm sorry. Again, I have to point out, because of the reporting around these clips, Allison is laughing because she's uncomfortable, rather than because she's having fun talking about her now-deceased ex-boyfriend. In this instance, she's embarrassed that she used an inappropriate word to describe him to an authority figure. Pay attention in the next clip to how she characterizes James, as it's extremely important. Um, we're all adults here. You can, you can say whatever you, you need to just, say. You were just being rude all the time, and I was just like, I don't want to put up with it. Was he ever abusive physically no, or no. mentally? Well, maybe mentally a little bit. He was just getting my head a bunch. When he got mad, what kind of things? Was he aggressive at all? Was he would he... just tell me everything that was wrong with me. He would say that nobody was going to love me anymore. Stuff like that because he's a child, but... Okay. Would he scream those things to you? No, or? all over text and everything. He would okay. never say it to my face, which... Okay. So you broke up in 2019. Did you remain friends after that? Not that last time, no. I said I didn't want to have anything to do with them anymore after that. But are you Facebook acquaintances or mm -hmm. anything like that where you could have kept on the eye on what you were doing? Mm -hmm. okay. I had blocked them on everything that I could have. Okay. Allie states that James could get mean at times and would undercut her, but she stopped short of accusing him of being abusive towards her. That is important, because if she and her father wanted to stack the deck against James and push a certain negative narrative around him, they certainly could have in this instance. It would have been easy for Allison to lie here and say that James was a horrendous person with no positive qualities, and that he had been a downright terrible boyfriend. But instead, she says he got mean when he was angry, and after the last breakup, she wanted nothing to do with him. That's an exceptionally normal way to contextualize a breakup, especially a teenage breakup. And then the voicemail or the call last night, when's the last time you had talked to him? Um, I th um, it was either last, the beginning of last year or the end of the year before, because my cousin had been living with us for a little bit. Okay. And him and my cousin were friends, so he came to pick him up. And I told Clay, my cousin, I was like, hey, did you tell him that I'm not comfortable with him being over and everything? Mm -hmm. He was like, yeah, that's fine. And that was it. But well, I never, like, personally said anything to him. Right. What's Clay's last name? Duke Krill also. Okay. So are, there, are they still friends that you know of? I don't know, because Colton, which is Clay's brother, had just pulled up messages to show one of the detectives you had. And I guess James was asking Clay about me. Okay. So I don't know if they were, like, still talking or if it was just that, hey. Do you know what kind of questions he was asking him? The, was, the only one that I saw, because, like, Lance, I was like, probably shouldn't be doing that, was, uh, can you give me Allison's address? And when were those texts sent? Last night, is what Colton said. Okay. So James, do you know if it was before or after he left your boyfriend? Oh, I don't know. I didn't That's see the okay. times on it. So he texted Colton. No, James. He texted I'm sorry, Clay. Yeah, James texted Clay, and then Clay sent those to Colton because Clay was in Cleveland. Okay. Colton was in town, so Colton would have been able to do something sooner. Okay. And he wanted to know your address specifically, yeah. or the one that you saw. Yeah. I mean, there was a flurry of messages, and that was the only one I saw. But the one guy got a picture of him. I don't know. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> there was a lot of people in yeah. your house today. Okay. Did he give him your address? I don't know. Okay. I hope not. Right, but do you think he knew where you lived because he's been there before with Clay? It was just that one time, so I don't know if he remembered it. Okay. Or, I don't know. Your car that you guys were in today, was that your mom's car? Yeah, my mom's Jeep. Does he know your mom's car? Like if he I don't had know. Been, I know he knows my car. Like if he, he had seen you guys riding around? See, that's what I thought, because, like, he was, like, right there. And you said he pulled in right, right as he got to the set. So, I mean, he had to have either been sitting somewhere in Tina's or he was just already calling. I don't know. I don't want to assume anything. Right. You don't remember him yeah, calling. Yeah, I don't. I didn't. I wasn't, like, on that. Right. When you guys pulled in, did you get right out of the car? Or? Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm very anxious. Okay. I'm, like, I'm in and out. I can't. That's fine. Okay. So, you got into the house. And then what happened? As soon as I got up to the door and was walking inside, that's when he got out. And I seen him walking up. So, I slammed the door really fast and I locked it. And I told mom and dad, so mommy was downstairs and got dad downstairs for us. Okay, so dad was downstairs? Yeah, he's in the basement. You have like a finished basement? Yeah. Or, okay, like family whole area. Room, but dad's cave? Yeah. Okay. So then dad came upstairs? 
Does, does he know why he's coming upstairs at that point? He said James was here. Okay. And he already had told Clay that James, he wasn't, he didn't want James back at the house. Okay. When you were dating James, did mom and dad like him? Did they yeah. get along with yeah, him? They have, yeah. He was respectful of yeah. them? Yeah. Very, okay. very nice. Never did anything to make him be like, you know. Did James get along with his family? With his mom and his stepdad. Yeah, I'm not sure about his biological dad. Okay. So I, his yeah, mom and dad were divorced. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do they live in Sydney as well? I think his mom and his stepdad do. I don't know about his dad. Okay. What's his mom's name, you know? If you don't remember. I don't. I'm sorry. It's okay. a couple. So they live in Sydney. He got along with mom and stepdad, but not so much dad. Yeah, as far as that's what it came off as when he was always talking about. Okay. And your family, he was always respectful yeah. of them. Yeah. Very nice. Do you know how he acted when they, he was told, possibly by Clay, that they really weren't comfortable mm -hmm. with him being there? No. You had, Clay didn't tell no, you anything? No, he, he's not a talker anyway. Okay, so. okay. He keeps, keeps everything to himself? Yeah. Okay, so Dad comes upstairs. Where is your Where is your downstairs door? I didn't go off um, your house. So if you come in the, the garage door and all, I don't know. If you go in the back sliding glass door, yeah. So we're in that little room where the sliding door is, mm -hmm. and then you go out to where the living room is, and there's that little hallway right there. Okay. The garage door is right here. Okay. And that little chute where the laundry room is, and then the basement door is right there, right okay. next to it. Okay. All right. So he came upstairs, yeah. and then what? And I kept looking at mom. I was like, I'm just gonna have to call the cops. I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with it. I was like, there's no use. He's not gonna listen. She's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And then we started talking to him through the ring a couple times. He just like had his head down, his hand behind his back. And dad's like, well, I don't like that. Did he knock at first, or was he just standing? He kept ringing right? the doorbell. So he he did yeah. keep ringing the doorbell. Yeah. Okay. And once the ring doorbell rings, when you start talking to it, it just starts recording. Okay. So you can hear Dad and Mom both, because I was like, I don't want to talk to him. Saying, hey, man, like, she doesn't want to talk to you, it's best if you just leave her right now. If she wants to reach out, she will. And he just stood there and kept ignoring him. So then Dad went out through the garage, and he didn't go around the corner or anything. He just stood there and was like, hey, man, trying to get him to answer and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then he tried to start to fiddle with the, uh, the door handle. Okay. And Dad's like, I don't like that. So he goes and gets his gun just in case. And where does Dad keep his gun? Uh, in his bedroom, I believe. I think it's in the nightstand next to his side, but okay. I'm not positive. Okay. So he's standing there. We're still talking to him through the ring, saying, hey, you need to stop. And he's like, now he's like really busting on the door. So Dad goes over and starts holding it shut. But I don't even know how, because like, he saw my dad. I hope he's a big man. <laughs> he starts, like, overpowering my dad. And I'm just like, okay. So your dad's on the other side of the door holding, yeah, physically yeah. holding it shut. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the phone with 911 at this point. I forgot that. That's okay. That's okay. And she's trying to get my information. Dad's holding the door. Mom's freaking out. And then, like, I don't know how he broke the glass through the door, but he, like, broke the glass, the door frame, whatever that's called, the jam or whatever, splits off. He is starting to get in. And then... I freak out and I go run and hide because I didn't know what to do. Before that, were you all in the living room? Yeah, we were all standing right there next to the fireplace. Me and Mom were. Okay. Over here. He's still at the door. I don't. I didn't even see when he shot or anything. I just heard it. I did. I I literally did most of the time. That's okay. I probably would have done the same thing. And then. Do you remember much after that, after hearing the shots? I screamed a bunch. Okay. And then I really, like, started freaking out. I was like, oh, my God. Okay. Um, and then after that, well, then these, our two neighbors ran over because they heard the shots. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at your house, was it the neighbors over to the right or to the left? If we're looking at the house, it would be the one on the, um, okay. that side. The north side? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about you're fine. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> and then um, they start trying to go over to him and see if he's okay. And mom's yelling. She opened the window and said, no, don't go over there. Because we didn't know if he had anything. Right. And we didn't want them to get hurt. We didn't want them to get injured or anything. If he shot back up, so they stayed there. Um, and then I think maybe like five minutes later, then uh, you guys all got out there. 
do you know, so if dad's holding the door and he, he broke that frame, mm -hmm. I didn't see the frame was all busted, and was kind of pushing your dad off of the door. Yeah. Now, if you don't remember, you don't remember, but did dad take a step back or before know. he shot, you don't remember? I don't know. I, didn't, I honestly, I wasn't even like seeing him. Okay. And then after it was over, where did where did everybody go? Um, I. Where did Dad go? He set the gun down and walked away. Okay. I did he go out the front door, or did he no, kind he, of come through the kitchen and open? I think he stood in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, Mom grabbed me because I thought I was going to throw up, and then we sat on the living room floor for a little bit. Okay. Okay. I think that's all that happened. Okay. Do you know if he was on any drugs or had he ever done any drugs that you know of? He's never done drugs. Okay. Do you know what his what his drug of choice is? He liked to do acid a lot. Okay. Back, back then. I don't know about recent. Because he moved out to California not too long ago and then came back. So I don't know if he like started something while he was out there. Acid is often used recreationally and is a hallucinogenic drug. Hallucinogens change the way people sense the world around them, while on acid, users go on trips, which can last for up to 12 hours at a time. Usually on these trips, you will experience hallucinations, like being able to see sound. LSD can also cause bad trips, where users experience panic, confusion, and sadness. Because of the hallucinations, they believe certain things are happening that aren't and react aggressively because of that. Again, Allie doesn't appear to be characterizing James negatively or stating that he had a drug issue. Rather, when he was younger, he dabbled in recreational drugs, which is often done by teens at his age. According to the autopsy results, James was not on any drugs at the time. Gotcha. When did he come back? How long has he been back in town, do you know? I want to say maybe a year. Okay. It's not too long, but not like recent either. But... How long was he living out there? Maybe about a year also. Okay. So back then when you were dating him and kind of friends with him, acid was his? Acid and weed and I don't know what else he did other than that. Was he ever on meth or heroin or anything? I don't know. know. Okay. I don't think he would have told me because he might have like it. Right. And that was his car that he was driving that you know of? I, last time I saw him driving a car, he had a red car. Okay. So I, don't, I don't know about That's fine. And then you guys just kind of went outside once? Yeah, they had us go sit out and nurse came. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm really sorry that this happened to you today. This is not how anyone wants their days to go, yeah. for sure. Is there anything about him that you think we should know about his personality? Has he ever threatened anybody before? Was he like a no, fighter? I thought, or I thought he was always very nice. I mean, he worked out all the time. I don't know if... If he did any boxing or anything, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, he, he was okay in high school, but then after he came back from California, he just was different. Like his close friends or whatever, he just started treating like crap, and nobody wanted to deal with it. Do you know if he had a current girlfriend? Not sure. All right. We have, we brought your phone back. Oh. Um, so they said you gave permission. Yeah, yeah. I do have a form here. Okay. If you don't mind signing no, it, just give us permission formally that we yeah. can look at it. And we'll get it back to you as soon as we can. Yeah. And you can just write your name. And then in this space here, put cell phone okay. and your phone number. Okay. And then if you can put your password. Okay. And then sign the bottom for me. And we will get that back as soon as we can. Oh, it's fine. It's, it's a purple. I don't care. What they'll do is download it and we'll just be, we'll look at it. Probably all the, I think you played Bond the Ring yeah, videos I, for. I was thinking that before that one on the ring, there should be another one where he just kept ringing the door. Yeah, started. and I'm pretty sure it should have recorded that one also. Did he call out to you or anything when you got there? No, he literally did not even say a word, which was, it like, put my little radar up on him. It's not normal.
when you were dating him, did he have any? Did he ever have any obsession with weapons or? Mm -hmm. I don't even think he ever wanted to own it. Okay. Anything. Wow. Well, no, he didn't talk about wanting to get a fishy dumpy a couple times when we were younger. Okay. Oh, right here. Yes, please. I'm pretty sure that his stepdad was really big into like guns and everything, but I don't know about him. Okay. And then your password? Yeah. It's all spelled out? Yeah. It's all it's all words, yeah. So when you bring up your phone yeah, and it has I, the number yeah, thing? It's not a number, it'll be a keyboard. Okay. <laughs> All right. Before you leave, I'll go grab that. Okay. Yeah. Chart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And is it all lowercase letters? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Um, this is, I feel like I'm so stupid. I don't know why I'm thinking of it. No, no but question is stupid. I don't know what to do about work. Are you supposed to work today? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. I mean, do you do you not want to go, or where do you work? Uh, it's called Riverside, but people always know what I say when I say Vision Mark. Okay. It's over there by a uh, car deal. Okay. Did you talk to the can you talk to the counselor a little bit out there at your That's house? Little, yeah. Okay. Um, I believe she's gonna be here, so okay. if you want to talk to her yeah. some more. I mean, that's going to be completely up to you. Are they strict or something about missing work, or is that, is that what you're worried about? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to lose my job. I mean, if you're asking if you're allowed to work, you can. Okay. You know, yeah, not, I, I didn't know, like, what I could do and I couldn't do, because I never... No, you're going to be allowed to do whatever you normally would do. We're not going to, you know, I, I came up and tell you, you, you can't leave your house, or you can do whatever you feel comfortable doing. Yeah, I, I didn't know what was okay. Right. If I was, if you need an excuse not to go in because yeah. you want a day, I mean, if you're seeing a counselor or something, I'm sure that they could probably yeah. get you something like that. But if you want to go to work, absolutely, yeah. you're, you know, you talk to your family tonight, and you guys kind of discuss. Yeah, I mean, if I call them and I call them, they'll be like, well, why? And I don't know what to tell them. You could just tell me you have a family emergency. Okay. I, mean, I just I don't want to get anybody else in trouble. Why would you get in trouble? I don't know if I can talk about things. You, you're not going to get anybody in trouble. You know how today's society is. Unfortunately, this was probably on Facebook. Probably. You know, because people, yeah. they won't know details, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what that is. And I would probably suggest. Yeah, I don't, I don't get on it anyways. Because people are ignorant and they'll have their own stories and it'll be, it'll sound ten times worse mm -hmm. than it is. So, yeah, I would just avoid it. Unfortunately, the news travels way too fast. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm worried about, like, names being, in the, like, in the paper or in the news. My dog's scared that people are going to come after him. Who would come after him? I don't know. He's just, he's, he's already anxious. Mm -hmm. And he's already... He's worried that he's going to have to look over his shoulder for all of us. Does James have friends that would be kind of like that? I don't think so, no, but he's, it's just, he's paranoid. I think you know, it's, it's okay, but... Yeah. Does Dad get treatment for his anxiety at all? He should. But he's not no. currently? Okay. I tried to talk. I was like, if you could, I'll go. And then I went by myself. And I Allison states that she's nervous about how her dad is going to be handling this because he deals with a lot of anxiety. She's also nervous about what the fallout of the situation will be, whether people are going to come to their house or not, and how he is going to deal with the situation. This will become incredibly relevant later on. I would, I would highly suggest that if you have a therapist or a counselor that you trust, well, we can hook you up with one if you'd like. Probably. Okay. I'll talk to the victim services advocate and we can get you into some counseling. I would highly suggest you go. This is this is this is a big deal. But you go at whatever comfort level as far as you know, if you can go to work. Will it end up in the paper? You know, Sydney on a Sunday afternoon, not much goes on. Yeah, I mean, it's not a big place anyways. Everybody knows everybody here. Exactly. Yeah. Really? I know how it'll be. 
realistically, it'll probably be in the paper. It'll probably there will there'll be names. I just I was trying to like calm them down with the book. Yeah. Right. So you guys as a family probably should do counseling as well. But if they don't want to go as a family, then you, you definitely I'll go by myself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll talk to mom. K in here. Can I get you? K in here. Can I get you? Mm -hmm. No. Bag of pretzels or anything. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you had Perkins, so that's going to hold you up yeah, for a little while, right? For a little while. Did you have anything good? They have pretty good food there. They would have really good food. It would have been better. Uh, 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 whole day. We couldn't even get a good breakfast. I know. That was Allison's interrogation. She was straightforward and cooperative, and didn't add any undue allegations towards Rail in her statement. Now let's watch her father, Mitch's interrogation. The interrogation has yet to start, but Mitch is already showing extreme signs of discomfort. He's breathing incredibly hard and he's likely sweating, which is why he keeps wiping his hand on his pants and takes his hat off. This is not a man who is proud of the fact that he killed a person who was breaking into his home, or is comfortable in the interrogation room. Just you, yeah. so just you, your wife, and your daughter in the residence yes. all day today. Okay, 
And um, do you remember what time they went to Perkins by chance? Roundabout? Nine-ish. Okay. And you stayed home alone? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then, um, go, go ahead. I started watching a Netflix movie. Okay. Um, about halfway through it, the dogs barked. I figured they were home. So I got posed that and was walking up the steps about halfway up and Stacy's standing there. She's like, you expecting somebody? And I'm like, no, why? I kind of don't remember as far as they said it was James maybe, but I didn't hear James because I didn't know who it was. I was like, I wasn't expecting anybody. He was just standing there. I had the door ringing. I, I think he rang the bell. So how long... So your your wife and your daughter arrived back from Perkins, okay? Um, he pulled in right behind them. Okay, so they did they come in that same front door, or did they enter I the think, garage, or do you I remember? I think they came in the front. Okay. Door. So they came in back in from breakfast, and then when they shut the door, did they lock it? I'm assuming they always lock it. Okay. And how long when they went in the house until James? Um, showed up on your front porch, do you think? I wasn't up there when he wasn't there. When I got up there, he was already at the door. Okay. Were you, were you, so you were down in the basement? Or, yeah. Okay. And then you, so you heard him come home, and then you came back, you came upstairs? Right. When they came home, and your wife asked if you were expecting anybody. Okay. I don't think, I don't know if they knew who it was, or maybe they did. Okay. Maybe they weren't sure. Okay. I don't know. Okay. But as soon as I freaked out because probably what happened the night, you know, the voicemail or whatever, mm -hmm. knew something wasn't right, and I started getting nervous, you know, because he wasn't answering, there. they was talking over the ring, telling him to leave, they don't, she don't want to talk to you. Was that over, like, the phone, or? I think they were using Or were they just yelling through the door? No, I think it was through the phone. Okay. Through the ring. Okay. That's got the voice thing. And they were... You're fine, you're fine. Like Allison, Mitch is uncomfortable. He is hunched over, constantly taking deep breaths, and struggling to get his words out because of that. But his memory is clear, his speaking is distinct, and what he is saying matches the video footage and the evidence that has been provided. They were just doing everything they could to make sure that he would leave, and that we didn't want him here, and I ended up going around to the garage door, opening it up, and walking around, and he's just standing there with his head down. And I said, James, I don't know exactly what I said. I know I said his name. You know, you need to leave or something like that. But he would just, he wouldn't acknowledge me. Didn't even budge. That made me kind of nervous. So you you opened the main garage door? The house garage door. Okay. And I walked around. You walked around to the front porch and said, James, you need to leave? Yeah. Okay. You need to go or leave and or something. And he didn't acknowledge you or anything? Move, like I wasn't there. Okay. So what That's happened? That's when I got nervous and I went back in, shut the garage door, made sure he didn't Fall sneak in. in. So it's shut. Went in, got my nine. Where was that? At? At, on my, my side of the bed in the nightstand. Okay. Was it in a drawer? Yeah. Okay. Do you always keep it fully loaded just for personal protection? Yeah. Okay. Do you know um, what kind of bullets you had in the gun? Um, Self-defense. Just like ball ammo or was it um, like it was, a whole point? It was a whole point. Okay. okay. Plastic, right. I believe, maybe. Okay. All right. Okay. And then after you um, grabbed your gun from your bedside table, what happened? I went back out and they were still trying to get him to leave and he wouldn't leave. And I was... As soon as I, I was standing there, there was debating on whether to call 911. I said, do it. Where were you guys standing at? Right there by the um, table. The, the kitchen table? Yeah, okay. the big one. Kind of in that opening there. There was a little bit more towards the bedroom. I said, call them. I want, I want somebody to get here, and they can take care of us and get him out of here. But then I noticed all that talking, trying to... They wouldn't acknowledge and I, I saw him starting to jiggle the, the handles and stuff, seeing if it was locked. And that's when I went up to the door and, you know, kind of wanted to make sure he didn't 
force his way in. So while he was jiggling the handle, you went up to try to open the door was, shut. I'm pretty sure I was telling him to stop and leave and get off my porch or something. But I had my nine in my hand, at this hand. And he, then he started hitting it with the shoulder pretty hard to where we saw what he did yeah. eventually. And once I realized he was getting in and the door was open is when I shot. Okay. Did you shoot through the door? I or shot through the window? Through the window part of the door because the door was open and he was coming in. So he was pushing his way in and, I and you shot. I had my socks on so I couldn't. I didn't have no grip. Was he kind of pushing you back as you were trying to yeah, hold him? he was moving me. Okay. That's when I, at first I wouldn't, I was trying to shoot but my clip wasn't at it. Okay. And then I freaked out and I finally did that, did another rack and then he was pushing hard and that's when I would, the gun fired. I think three times. Twice up here and maybe another one. I'm pretty sure it was three. Okay. And uh, do you recall like after you fired the first round through the glass, did he eventually get the door all the way swung open? Or do you think all the shots were through that glass window? It was all through the glass. It's all through the glass. Okay. Sure. And from what I remember, your your kind of front door glass was is it is it like an oval? Like long oval. Okay, I got you. Okay, and then what happened after that? After the shots, he had he had turned and went off of the porch, and it's kind of hard to remember after that. I understand. Just take your time. We was all freaking out, obviously. And I looked out again, and his leg, I saw his legs laying there, and I was seeing if he was moving, or if he wasn't. But then the neighbor had come up, going, you know, like, and we was trying to yell at him to stay back, because I didn't know if he was... He, from my understanding, Mitch, he was outside, and he heard some gunshots, and he was... He was more concerned. He just didn't know what exactly happened. I think that's why he came over to maybe check on you guys or just oh, something to that effect. But yes, and then so you told him to stay back, okay? And then um, did you go back in the house after you? Did you? Where did you see him at? We lived. Um, I didn't go back out. Okay. I stayed away from it. Okay. Did you go outside? To, and you said you saw him laying there or something. So. He, he was you, completely okay. around the corner. Okay, but you didn't leave the porch. Did you come out on the porch at all? I did not. I didn't want to touch anything. Or did you come outside at all, or outside of your threshold? I, I guess I should say. No, okay. I don't think I did. You could just see his feet from yeah. there. Okay, I understand. Okay, and then um, did who called nine one one? Did you guys call nine one one? Or did they, they were they were in the process? I think we was online with, on the phone with them before he had tried to. Break the door down. Okay. You so either they, your they were on the on the nine one one call during that whole thing. So either your daughter or your wife well, I think called. I my daughter was. Okay. Cause so were they still had the ring up on their phone or whatever? Maybe my wife did. Okay. okay. And then okay. I'm not okay. sure. I understand. And then Allie might have been on with nine one one. Okay. Okay. And then uh, did you guys all just stay inside until deputies or yeah. I understand Sydney police came out there as well because they were probably. Um, a little closer maybe. Right. So you guys just stayed inside until they got yeah, on scene. We didn't want to gotcha. move. Okay. What is your... So I understand that James used to date your daughter. Okay. How long did they date for? I don't know how okay. long. Um, if you had to guess... Um, honestly, I don't... Uh, no. Would, would you say it was a considerable time? Like, were they kind of serious? Or? Yeah, I think they were friends for a while, and then they went out for a little bit. It didn't, didn't quite work out. This was a couple years ago. Okay. And Allie and didn't want to see him anymore for some reason. I never got involved in that. I understand. But then I guess he moved to California for a little bit, and then he just he had come back. And then for two years, I didn't text or talk, I guess, until last night. They didn't tell. They don't really tell me stuff about guys because right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not assuming right. daughters don't want to right. talk too much with their dad about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, did you ever 
I understand you guys moved out to that house about a year and a half ago or so. Were they were they dating while you guys lived out there, or when you guys lived in Sydney? Um, in Sydney. Okay. On Edgewood. So they never dated when you guys lived no, out there. So but he, he had been there. Had he? Because okay. he was friends with my nephew. The same nephew as other. No, his okay. other brother. I got you. And he had brought, he had known that they were having issues with each other, and okay. he, he brought him out. And Allie got upset about it, of course, and mm -hmm. told Clay not to ever bring him over again. Okay. And that was the last about, time. Do you recall about how long ago that was? I don't know. Okay. It was sometime within the last year of them breaking up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Did you ever, um, would you say you knew James on a personal level, or did you ever talk to him, or? What, did, did he visit your guys' house in Sydney often when you and your, when your honestly, daughter and him were dating? Honestly, I don't recall meeting him. Yeah. Okay. All right. You just kind of probably just heard your daughter talk about him in passing, maybe. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I knew it was, I wanted him not to go out the way that Allie was saying that they didn't get along and she thought they had it all taken care of and everybody went their separate ways, but I guess not. When your daughter and your uh, wife came back from breakfast, did they think that it was James? Because I understand James maybe pulled up behind him as they pulled in their driveway when they came in. Did they see him? or did I'm, they... I'm not sure because I thought I could have swore Stacy asked me if I was expecting anybody. Okay. At what point did you realize that it was James? When Allie said it's James. And Allie said it was James. Could you see him through the glass? It's hard to see through, but I saw him. I didn't recognize him because you can't really see facial. Okay. But you knew what he looked like no. prior to this? Truthfully, no. No. Okay. Your daughter just said it was James. Okay. All right. Again, I can't imagine what you're going through with this. services kind of give you any information about who you can talk to and, and yeah. things like that. Yeah, they were really helpful. While we go through this process. And Tiffany, the, the female that was out there with you today from victim services, she's still here with you, okay? She's, I think she's out in the lobby with your wife, okay? Yeah. Um, but she will be here. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything you can remember, maybe you just want to comment about the incident? Do you happen to remember what you did with the firearm? Yeah, I put it on the kitchen table. On the kitchen table. Okay. And then um, when the, when law enforcement got there, did they, I'm sure they probably secured the gun yes, or something. Yes, they did. Okay. Do you always get it's hard to say, but due to his increased breathing and the fact that he wiped his face, I believe Mitch is crying. Again, this is not the face of a man gleefully delighting in shooting a man who is breaking down his door, as it's been characterized in various headlines. The magazine full is loaded with your firearm. Yeah, normally I don't put the clip in. So you didn't have one in the chamber, like when you went and got it from your bedside table. I don't keep it. That's why you had. That's why you had to rack it. Yeah. Gotcha. I just don't know why. I don't. I just don't want to grab it and have it go off. I guess. Yeah. I want to make sure. Do you know if that firearm's registered in your name, Mitch? I don't think it is. I got it from Stacy's dad. Stacy's dad. Okay. And he, went, he went into the home and. Okay. So he he just gave it to you, or did you yeah, buy he it? Wanted me to have all this. Okay. So. Do you know Stacy's dad's name by chance? Um, Gregory Cole. Anything 
else you'd like to talk about, Mitch? This will be over with, but I know we got to do, do it. Like I said, today we're just cover, trying to cover our bases, okay? Um, and that's why we just want to talk to you each separately, just to try to get each one of your stories and um, go from there. Okay. So well, we did everything we could to get him to leave. How long do you think he was standing on that front porch for? Oh. Activated or is, like, do you have to physically hit the button? motion. Okay. So I think it's, it takes a minute for it to kick on, but once somebody's there, it should okay. stay on. Because the video that I saw um, from the ring doorbell, it only lasted about a minute or so. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure why. And it, there could Sometimes be. Sometimes they cut off if, even if you're standing there. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, and it could just be another. There might be past recordings too of like you know when you first got there when you're when you're. Uh, wife and daughter walked in there, that I'm sure there might be a different recording or something like that too. That's possible. Yeah. Okay. I was just kind of curious if you knew how long he was there. Um, so when you, your wife and daughter got home from breakfast, you think they were there for like 10, 15 minutes? After they got home? Yeah. You mean, uh... From Perkins? No, they, they had just got there when Stacy... Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you must start something. Um, how long... Do you think James was on the porch, like, trying to get into your house? Oh. As far as physically trying to get in, or just... Like... Standing there. Um, Not from the time he pulled up in his car to walked in to when the incident happened, how long do you think? 10, 15 minutes, maybe, of him not answering, or, you know, just standing there. Okay. So he was there for a while. Yeah, it was... It seemed like forever. Did, did he go anywhere else that you know of, or was he always on the front porch? He moved around a little bit. Okay, what do you mean? Sometimes uh, he wouldn't be right in front of them. Okay. And I would be like, where did he go? Did he go around, or... But then he would be back in front of the window, part of the door. So you guys were standing in the, the kitchen area, living area, all three of you, for 10 to 15 minutes trying to get him to leave? Yeah. Okay. And he just wasn't responding? He wasn't or, responding to anything. And then you went in the garage and um, opened the main garage door, went around and said, James, you need to leave, or something to that effect. Right. And then you realized that something wasn't up, something or right. wasn't, was, wasn't right, and then you went back in and closed the door. Yeah. And then... I got nervous. And then you... So then after you went in the garage, that's when you grabbed the gun. Yeah. It's just... I know it's probably really hard to remember.
Okay, go on. I want to spread. I'm just going to keep you company for a minute. Man. I appreciate it. Jeff said that uh, you don't want to be left alone. The officer who just came in said that Mitch doesn't want to be left alone. Though we don't know exactly why he would say this, given Allison's statement about his anxiety, as well as his continued labored breathing and emotional state, it's clear to see that Mitch is heavily affected by what has happened, and is not in a good headspace. He is scared, upset, and dealing with the fact that he's taken a life, which was clearly not what he ever intended. Having company in the room, even if it's an uninformed police officer who he has never met, is seen as a welcome relief from his own thoughts. If you've ever been anxious or in the middle of a panic attack and just had someone sit next to you and talk to you about their day, you know how helpful it can be. Just to have someone else to focus on, rather than the thoughts in your own head, would be a lifeline. Completely understandable, man. How are you feeling overall, housewives? <clears throat> Compared to early, like, just kind of... It's up and down. Up and down. It's going to be that way, man. Unfortunately, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. I mean, I'd say this much. Good thing you had the ring doorbell. That ring doorbell really helps. Yeah, you said it. He only saw like a minute of it and it cut out. I don't know what's going on with that, but something I don't want to watch. Yeah, yeah, I could, I would highly recommend against not trying to review that in. Everything that you're already going to play back in your head is going to be hard enough. You don't need to add into it. It's cleaning that up. It, not a problem at all. You good, man? This interrogation was called a joyful, happy affair by multiple different outlets. However, it was anything but. On August 5th, five days after the shooting, a Shelby County prosecutor and the Shelby County Sheriff released the following joint statement. On Sunday, July 31st, 2022, at approximately 11.05 a.m., the Shelby County Sheriff's Office Dispatch Center received a 911 call from an Allison Duke Row at 2907 North Cuther Road, Sydney, Ohio, who said a male was attempting to enter their residence. Soon after the call was initiated, three distinctive gunshots were heard. Dispatch kept Duke Row on the line as they dispatched units to the residence and two Sydney Police Department units arrived at the scene, followed by Shelby County Sheriff's Office units. Upon arrival, units found a male, later identified as James Rail, 22, of Sydney, Ohio, at the northeast corner of the garage. Units began to render first aid by placing defibrillator pads on the male. The Fort Loramie Rescue Squad arrived on scene and assessed the male and found that he was deceased. The scene was then secured with crime scene tape and the body was covered. Shelby County Sheriff's Office detectives were called to the scene and began an investigation. The scene was processed, evidence was collected, and a canvas of the residences north and south of 2907 North Cuther Road was conducted. Three witnesses gave statements and confirmed hearing multiple shots from the residence. The inside and outside of the residence was processed. Sydney Police Department Captain Jerry Tangman used an OSCR 360 device, which supplied 360-degree spherical photos and presented a virtual walkthrough of the scene. The front door was a solid wooden door with a deadbolt. The deadbolt was found to be in the locked position, and the casing to the lock of the door was broken. Three holes were found in the decorative glass window in the door, and three hollow point 9mm spent cartridges were found on the floor. The weapon was located on the mantle of the fireplace. The occupants of the residence were identified as Mitch Ducro, Stacy Ducro, and Allison Ducro, and initial interviews of the Ducros were conducted at the scene. Mitch Ducro indicated he fired the weapon and admitted to discharging it three times. Allison Ducro said she was familiar with James Rail, as they dated each other until they broke it off a year and a half earlier. She made law enforcement aware of a voicemail that Rail left for her late in the previous evening. Mr. Rail was transported to the Montgomery County Coroner's Office for an autopsy. Sheriff Fry and Lieutenant Detective Brown 
went to the residence of James Rail's parents to make the death notification and relay what was known thus far about the incident. Video from a ring doorbell camera from the Ducro residence was collected, which captured the visual and audio of the actions of the involved individuals. The video depicts James Rail approaching the front door of the residence and ringing the doorbell. While at the front door, Rail was advised to leave and was warned that the owner was armed with a gun. Eventually, Rail opened the screen door, shook the front door handle repeatedly, and rammed his shoulder into the door, forcing it open. Simultaneously, with the door being breached, three shots can be heard in rapid succession. Rail turns to retreat, walks several feet, and goes to the ground where he passes away. A 911 call was placed while Rail was at the door and is consistent with what was depicted on the Ring video. On Monday, August 1, 2022, two Shelby County Sheriff's Office detectives attended the autopsy of James Rail at the Montgomery County Coroner's Office, and detectives informed that Rail was shot three times, once in the left shoulder, the right shoulder, and the back. Detectives were informed that glass shards were found in the back wound, which was a close proximity wound and found to be the shot that caused the death of Rail. Later that day, detectives met with Prosecutor Sell, and it was decided that the case would be presented to the next Shelby County Grand Jury. On August 2, 2022, Sheriff Fry and Lieutenant Detective Chris Brown met with Rail's stepfather, mother, and sister at the Sheriff's Office, where they discussed the information obtained in the investigation to date, and provided copies of the 911 calls, ring video, and video of the interviews with the Ducro family. Several tips, including tips provided by Mr. Rail's family, were investigated by the Sheriff's Office during the week, and no new information was found. All photographs, witness statements, verbal autopsy results, 911 calls, ring videos, interview videos, the weapon and ammunition, and the body and cruiser camera videos were compiled for presentation to the grand jury, which convened on August 4th, 2022. Prosecutor Sell presented evidence to the grand jury that included the ring videos, 911 recordings, multiple photographs of the scene, the recorded interview of Mr. Ducro, and the conclusions of the coroner. The prosecutor advised the grand jury of the law regarding the crimes of murder, voluntary manslaughter, and reckless homicide, as well as the Stand Your Ground and Castle Doctrine laws recently enacted by the Ohio State Legislature. The grand jury deliberated and determined by an 8-1 to vote that a felony indictment should not be issued in this incident. However, that's not where the story ends. In the aftermath of James's death, his sister, Jessica Colbert, has been campaigning to get the case reopened, stating that there is a large-scale cover-up taking place in Shelby County, much like Sarah Turney had. She believed because the Ducros lived next door to a police officer and that Allison had previously worked as a 911 dispatcher that they had killed James for an unknown reason and covered up his death by making it seem like he had broken into their house. She created two Facebook pages, one public and one private, writing that the investigation that had been conducted was a farce, meant solely to frame her brother as a drug-addled criminal who was going to hurt Allie. She believed that the evidence in the case had been tampered with, and spoke to multiple publications, like the Daily Mail, the New York Post, and Inside Edition, saying things like the police only investigated for two hours, and that the case was rushed to the grand jury to see if they should indict Mitch Ducro. As previously stated, the grand jury voted to not indict Mitch, given the fact that James was actively breaking into the home, and there was video footage of the entire incident. Jessica went on to post unflattering photos of Allison, claiming that after shooting James, she boasted that, quote, 
we shot his ass, unquote. This claim isn't backed up with any direct evidence and is more rumor than it is fact. Jessica even states she heard this secondhand. She went on to say that throughout Allison's interrogation, she was laughing and making jokes, showing no remorse or sorrow at what had occurred. She also went on to post the Duke Rose home address online after they placed their home up for sale. If you remember, Allie stated she was worried something like this would happen and spoke about her dad's anxiety. She wrote, Who would want a house where you shot and killed James? Trying to run Mitch, Stacy, and Allison. James died in your driveway by by the hands on you. He's gone. No one ever wants a house where a crime like that happened. I hope it's hell for you guys, just like it's been hell for us getting through this. On August 21st, Jessica uploaded the video, entire ring segments together, James Rail, hashtag justice for James Rail to YouTube. It has since been taken down for graphic content, and a portion of it was used earlier, which I marked as being biased, as the audio had been removed on select portions. The portions of the video where the audio has been removed is important, as they are segments where James was being asked to leave by the family. They were telling him he needed to get off of their property, that Allison didn't want him there, and he still stayed, and eventually broke in. I have left a link to the original video, as saved by the web archive, if you would like to view it and confirm that it has not been taken out of context. In the description of the video, Jessica gives the series of events that she believes led to James's death. She wrote, We want a full investigation. James was extremely tired. He stayed up all night the night prior, and had a hard time sleeping at night, adjusting from a third shift schedule he had. What was not said in the investigation, too, was he was not home the night prior, which would have been a few minutes away from the Ducro home. He was three hours away, near Cleveland, visiting friends and family, with the intention to stay up there for a mini vacation, but for some reason, he drove all the way back there. But the big question is, why? He left Allison a voicemail on Saturday, July 30th at 11.40 p.m., Allison Ducro texted him back at 11.58 p.m. saying, What's up? What's up is the only one that was sent as a text message and not iMessage. iMessage doesn't show up on phone records. iMessages do show up on phone records and the police would have been able to see her response if she had responded. Of note is the fact that no message from Allison to James has ever been made public. No screen recording or screenshots have ever been produced to confirm that this is factual. The evidence was shared with Jessica and her entire family, and they have access to James's phone. Given Jessica's posting about the case, it's questionable why she wouldn't post the evidence she has access to. But her statement continues on. Police took her phone into custody, but somehow the rest of the texts are gone. Mitch Ducro shot him in the back twice. The door only shows two holes. James had three gun wounds. All witnesses heard four to five shots. So many lies. Based on the evidence photos which have been released, the autopsy results, and the video of what occurred, we know that a lot of what is being claimed here is not factual. James wasn't shot in the back twice, and simply shot as he ran away. He was shot through the door, first in both of his shoulders, then in the back when he began to run. This much is on video. James's family had given this information immediately, and the police had been, by all accounts, incredibly forthcoming with information. Later on, Jessica posted photos of the Duke Rose home from their Zillow listing on Facebook stating that Mitch was likely drunk the morning of the shooting because he had a home bar and decorated with beer bottles around the house. She also posted the following TikTok and reels. I don't ask for help often. I handle my own healing. All I want is a real investigation on what happened to my brother instead of a cover-up because the man who shot my brother was neighbors with the sheriff and his daughter was a dispatcher oh but guess what they deleted the picture of her daughter his daughter as a dispatcher on facebook that doesn't change it she was a dispatcher we know that there is corruption and this is a load of crap mm -hmm.
think it's been mentioned that 12 seconds before James even touched that door, Allison Ducro was screaming. Do you know how many times James has had to try to rescue her from her depression and suicidal thoughts? According to the Facebook pages and Twitter, the following is what the family believes to have happened to James. July 30th, James was unable to sleep due to his new schedule on the third shift, and he called Allie and left a voice message. Allie then texted him back, saying what's up, and the next day she told him to come over. That, or she told him that her parents were holding her hostage and wouldn't let her leave, or that she was in serious mental despair and needed him to get her help. This, they believe, was done via iMessage, which the police are unable to look at, which is factually inaccurate, but continuing. James picked up two Lunchables and brought them with him, thinking that they could eat them together in his car. When he arrived, he pulled in directly after Allison and her mom got back, and Allie, in the moment she paused, wasn't confused, but beckoning him in or indicating that she's being held against her will. Despite being outside and able to get to his car, she goes inside and locks the door. James was still under the impression she wanted him to come inside, though. He goes to the door, rings the doorbell, and is met with no response. The family doesn't talk to him or say anything. They just sit quietly as he stands on their porch. I say this as the footage from the ring doorbell was edited to make it appear that way. It's only after he opens the glass door that they begin to react, and he knocks on the door, trying to get let in. But Mitch, who Jessica describes as a trigger-happy alcoholic who is already drunk at 10 a.m., shoots James, thinking him knocking is busting down the door. That is clearly far-fetched and untrue. But let's say for a moment it was true. Allie invited her ex-boyfriend to her home, but then when he arrived, and the family said they didn't want him on their property, and was no longer welcome, or that he believed that Allie was in the middle of a mental health crisis. Either of those things justifies him breaking into the home. If he believed Allie was in trouble, he could have called the police or paramedics. He could have called her from his car to ask her to come outside, or talk to the parents through the door. Instead, he stood there silently, until he broke the door off its hinges, and put the family in fear of their life. Looking into this case as a third party, it doesn't appear to me that this is a cover-up by the police. There wasn't a conspiracy to kill James. James might have, by all accounts, been a perfectly wonderful person in every other aspect of his life, but he made the decision to break into his ex-girlfriend's house after being told repeatedly to leave and being informed that they had a gun. While it's entirely possible he had nothing but good intentions towards Allison, the likelihood that a former romantic partner is breaking into your house and using excessive force to get to you for good reasons is incredibly low. With that in mind, Allie's father made a decision to protect his daughter, and given his distraught appearance after the fact, it's not something he took lightly. Let me know what you personally think in the comments down below. This video was difficult to make, but it felt necessary. If there is another topic you would like to see me cover, please leave it in the comments down below, or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. If you want to support my content, consider joining my Patreon. Have a great day, and remember to stay safe.